so sad that they were short of singer. But I am sad that we didn't have to hear this. We get to wait for the spatial music. Maybe next week. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Marcia was having a busy week, and she forgot to put that in there. Joshua 1, 8. The title of the message is God's Law. It's faith in a blue faith or whatever faith day it is, but can you imagine a society without any laws? Imagine driving through Pittsburgh or bigger than that, Charlotte or New York City without any traffic laws. Can you imagine being anywhere where there were no, no laws? There wouldn't be much order. There was a time when that happened. Genesis 6 verse 5 says that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Can you imagine that? A time when there was no law. Well, then we're, we're going to look at that. You know, and I ask God to help guide me in this message. And we're going to look at the stated law, God's law, the satisfied law, and the simplified law. As we look at the law of God, Joshua, and to give you the, I'll, I'll give you the background a little bit. But laws are written with a purpose and a reason. And God's motives are always right. If God writes the law, it has a good motive, and he is looking out for our good and his glory. And he gives the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and we'll get there under the stated law, but he gives them to protect the Israelites and to keep them safe and to keep them away from harm and danger and to guide them even in their dietary laws and their taking care of situations. And that's what he explained to him in, in Exodus chapters 20 to, verse, to chapters 34. But they're given to us with God's laws, there is a right motive. And they are involved in many areas of life. Man's laws get tainted. And there's sometimes an agenda behind them. They'll create a law so that they can gain financially or they'll create a law so that they can control a situation, or whatever that is. God's laws are not like that. His laws are to protect and guide, and his laws are not grievous, and his commandments are for our good. And we'll get there as we see it. So Joshua 1.8, Joshua is given the command to the Israelites before they go into the promised land, and he's giving, telling them, you better do what God says. And he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. There's not a person in this room that does not want to have a life of success and to have a prosperous journey. Well, there's a way you can have it is when you make much of God's word and you understand it, and you obey it, and you know his will for your life, and you follow that, and the laws that God has, they are there for us, and you know, I'm glad that we don't have to do what they did in the Old Testament, but the sacrificial system, and I'm glad that he came, and then as we get to the second point, that he satisfied the requirements of the law. So let's look at this, the stated law. And under the stated law, as I said, he gives that to Moses in Exodus chapter 20. In Genesis, there was no real law. There was the situation in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's where I believe that mankind got a conscience. And we know the difference between right and wrong because that was obtained through the fall of man. And when we know the difference from right or wrong, there's an accountability involved. But yet there is no stated law. And the stated law comes in the book of Exodus. But when they, the Garden of Eden, after they had this knowledge of good and evil, by chapter 6, they are doing everything that is right in their own eyes. Man will self-destruct without God. And we don't make good decisions without his wisdom and his guidance. But they did what was, they thought was right. And you know what that led to? Chapter 8, where Noah had to build an ark. Because it grieved God that he had made man, because man was so evil in their hearts and against what was right. And so they had the great flood take place. Then you get Moses coming onto the scene and all the preparation that God made for him. And he brings the Israelites out of Egypt and the bondage that they were in. Then he takes, as they're in the wilderness, he takes Moses to the Mount Sinai. 
And I'm looking at the when, the where, and the what. The when was right before they were going to go into the promised land. God is going to give instructions to that nation. And he's given them through Moses. And you know, Moses was a unique man. He, and I am really encouraged that God spoke to him face to face as friend with friend. They had that kind of relationship. And Moses goes up into the mountain where God instructs him to go. And the, the law was declared by God. And if you can see that in Exodus 20, if you go there. Uh, but it, it was written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. There's no, nothing new about laser engraving. God can do it with his finger in stone. Can you imagine that? That's how he did that. He declared it exactly how he wanted it. Moses delivers it to the crowd below the mountain. Remember the setting? He's up in the mountain getting the instructions and the laws that God has for them, and he comes down there, and guess what has happened? The people were worshiping a golden calf under the leadership of Aaron, that thorn in Moses' side that he thought he needed so badly, they're down there, and they're having a festivity that was out of control, and then he deals with the situation, gets angry, and busts the tablets of stone, and he chastises the people for their idolatry, worshiping a golden calf. They've seen God do all those miraculous things, and they resort to worshiping an image that they had created, and to put the icing on the cake, they lie and say, well, we put all this gold in the furnace and out came this golden calf. No, they manufactured it. But nonetheless, he broke the, the first law. Then he had to, they get duplicated. He goes up a second time. And he gets the second issue of commandments. Why did he have to do it? Because the disobedience of society. Man has a tendency to do evil. As the sheriff stood here and said that the young generation has so much negative influence. And let me tell you, the culture isn't helping it. And they're not helping in the technology arena or in the entertainment that they're putting out there for the kids to see. And I talked to an Indian pastor from India, and he shared with me the concerns he had. He said, in India, it's all about education. Everybody gets educated. There's not sports. There's not side events, it's just educate, 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 and better the culture, and, and do what you can to improve things. He said, and most of the nations of the world do that, but the United States of America isn't doing that. The United States of America is getting worse and worse. I can only think of Psalms where it says, the nation, the, the nation that does not have God as their Lord, it'll fall. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And if the Lord isn't the Lord of your life and the Lord of your play, it's going to be bad. And that's the way it was in, before Moses and in Moses was dealing with when they received the law of God. So the, law, the stated law of God was given in Exodus chapters 20 to 34. Now the problem with the stated law is that you couldn't keep all the laws. We have a sinful nature and we, des we desire to do wrong just because we have that nature. And, you know, it wasn't enough to have a written law, and it wasn't enough to have a sacrificial system because the sacrificial system only covered transgressions, and every year they'd have to go back and go back and go back for their sins to be covered. In order for their sins to be forgiven, it would take a perfect lamb to be sacrificed, and that happened to be Jesus. So we go to the satisfied law that required that perfect sacrifice. Jesus was not here to break the law, he was here to fulfill it. He was not a law breaker, he was a law maker. He made them and he came and he fulfilled them. So through this satisfied law, the law requires this, and so Jesus provided that. And it can give us forgiveness and it can give us fulfillment. When Jesus was on the cross, he offered both of those things. He said to the crowd, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And then he also fulfilled it because he said, it is finished. And that is the same words that was used that the debt has been paid, as they would put over a prison cell, then the ransom or the bail was paid, and the, the time had been served, that they had fulfilled their sentence. So there's forgiveness and fulfillment 
through the satisfied law that Jesus did. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus was speaking, and he says, Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He didn't come to eliminate, he came to satisfy. And he did satisfy that debt. For whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. And whoever believes in him can have eternal life. That thief on the cross is a perfect example of that. That guy that had deserved to die for murder or treason or whatever his crime was. He deserved it. But yet he cried out for forgiveness and Jesus said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. That guy never went one Sunday to church. He never gave a nickel in the offering. He never parked a car in the parking lot. He never did community service. He died on the cross and went to be with Jesus. Forgiveness came from that faith and trust in him. And it's still that way. So the satisfied law, the stated law, and lastified, and I encourage you to turn there with Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 is the simplified law. There is no way that we can keep all the laws that God gave. Because, you know, when you break one, you have broken them all. And then we're guilty of the whole penalty. But we needed that forgiveness. Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 36. What is the greatest law? Matthew 22, 36. Jesus is being questioned by a lawyer. It says in verse 35, testing him. The lawyer was putting him on the spot. And Jesus always gave the right answers. And he says to him, Teacher, what, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love God and you love your neighbor, you will fulfill all the other laws. You say, how can that be? Well, if you love your neighbor, are you going to kill them? If you love your neighbor, are you going to lie to them? If you love your neighbor, are you going to cover with love? If you read Corinthians, it tells you what it is and what it isn't. Love will cover a multitude of sins, so says the scripture. So there's the simplified law. You say, well, I can't even remember all laws. You only got to remember two things, love God and love others. And if you love God and you love others, it'll come into play. And if everybody would do that, it would change the whole culture. It's the simplified law that changes people. In Psalm 1, 1 and 2, it talks about the person who delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law, you know, there's a lot of things that are byproducts of that. It says, blessed is that man who doesn't walk with the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law of the Lord. And if this is the greatest law, why shouldn't we delight in it? When you love God and you love others, that means that you're going to be willing to serve them and to help them and encourage them and forgive them and be able to understand with them. Not only does it uh, change people, when, do you notice how that if you show someone some love, it can change their attitude? That you didn't walk up to them harshly and get in their face about something, that you were kind, and that you let them go first? When the line's building up at the shopping center and you would like to get out of there and you say, well, go ahead, you only have a couple items. You know, your cart's running over full of things and the lady comes with her little bag of bread. If you cut in front of her, shame on you. You ought to be compassionate. And you know what? You're allowed to give that closer parking place to somebody else if you're not in a hurry. But if you're in a hurry, look out. You know how that is. But you know, it'll change people. Not second thing that by fulfilling this simplified law will do is it'll produce peace. Psalm 119, 165 says, great peace have they that love your law and nothing will offend them. If you love his word and you love the law of the Lord and you love the Lord of the law, it'll change your life by producing this peace. Third thing it will do, it also provides some accountability because it requires enforcement. Law enforcement people are with us today. They would be without a job in a lawless society. Nothing to enforce. Do you know who enforces the law? God. 
He's the judger of man. Jesus has that authority given to him by the Father to be the judge of the world. We all will stand before him, and that is a certainty. You will, everyone born that has ever lived will stand before God and give an account to what they have done, one, with Jesus, what they do with the gift of forgiveness and the offer of eternal life. If they're standing before him for that, if they rejected it, they're in bad shape. But if you're standing before him for what you have done with what he entrusted you, it's a whole different story. Because he is a merciful God, and he is a God full of compassion. And he has forgiven your sin, and he also understands your frame. And he also says that he will wipe away all of our tears from our eyes and we'll be forever with him in joy. So there should bring encouragement to your heart. The required enforcement, there are assigned consequences if you violate his law. And there are also not only assigned consequences, there's that certain accountability. And I conclude it with a verse from 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul is encouraging Timothy to tell the truth and to walk in a sincere faith. He says to him, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. You use his word the way that it is written. And he knows that he is there to provide protection to us and to give us opportunities to others. So as it comes down to the fact that it's a personal choice whether we obey God's word or we reject it, it comes to, do I want to serve him or not? Joshua, who started out with the admonition to the Israelites, this, this book will do this and God's law will do this in your life. What's your decision? And at the end of the book, in chapter 24 of Joshua, he gives his perception. 14 and 15 he says to the Israelites, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The personal choice. God doesn't make you obey him. You have to choose. He doesn't make you receive forgiveness and eternal life. That's your decision. You get to accept or reject him. But also in these decisions, you have the accountability, the consequences, right or wrong. The consequence for receiving Christ is you get to spend eternity with him in heaven. Rejecting him is you spend eternity away from him in the place called hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the options. The options for choosing to obey him as a Christian produces positive things. If you disobey him, it produces chastisement. We have a choice. We have a choice to obey laws or disobey laws. Civilly, we have a choice to obey laws or disobey laws spiritually. And you know that all, they all have a harvest. The laws of the harvest don't change. And it comes down to what do you want to produce? And what do you want to, where do you want to end up? Choices matter. And it affects not just us, it affects others. And when you make choices that are good, it helps others do the same. When we make choices that are bad, it does the same thing. It comes down to law and order. Without law, there is no order. And when you keep the law, there will be perfect order and there will be blessings that come along with it. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we know that you're a good God and we know that we can't do it on our own. We can't keep the law. We can't save ourselves. But you can do all that. You fulfilled the law. You offer forgiveness. And whoever calls upon you can have this eternal life. If there's anyone in this auditorium that hasn't made that decision, may they accept you as Lord and Savior and ask you for forgiveness of their sin. And those of us who are believers, may we choose to do what is right, to honor your word, to obey it without hesitation, and to obey it completely. 
to be willing to love and forgive and to witness and to share your truth to others in our lives. Thank you, God, for this admonition. Thank you for your patience, your gentleness, and care. And as we conclude the service with a reminder that you are faithful in every aspect of life, even when we fail, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.